Okay, bear with me. This is going to be maybe a little longer because first I want to straighten out uh, some of the works uh, from last week. Just give you a little more clarification. Um, first of all, as to Phyllis Wheatley's poem, most of you did a pretty good job. I just want to make one point very clear. Um, you could have certainly uh, chosen any word, I think, and made a case that it was important in that poem. Here's Anna's post. Um, just thought it was pretty good and I'd share it. After reading Whitley's, Wheatley's poem on being brought from Africa to America, the word that most stands out to me is redemption. Primarily, this word shows how Wheatley's life bears the likeness of a large-scale redemption story. She was redeemed quite literally. She was bought with a price as she was sent from Africa to America. She was redeemed through her liberation from slavery. Additionally, she uses this word as an allusion to Christianity. By using this particular word, she was able to describe her life story. She was able to highlight, I thought this was good, the juxtaposition between Christianity and racism. Furthermore, this one word helps to highlight the hypocrisy of a predominantly Christian nation practicing racism rather than believing in the redemptive power of God for all. Wheatley references the curse of Cain to suggest that she was predestined for persecution because of the color of her skin. While people can see that racism was actively practiced by her oppressors, she offers the notion that it was their skin color that actually cursed her. Moreover, this beautifully echoes the concept of redemption as she redeems the wrongdoings of her persecutor. And that was nicely done. I do want to emphasize this notion of Cain's curse equaling skin color was totally off. In fact, impossible. As noted, and I hope you really caught this, as noted by John Woolman, it was impossible because all of the earth was destroyed in the flood except for Noah and his family. Noah was not a descendant of Cain's. If, if you go through Old Testament biblical lineage, that's clearly laid out. Uh, so this conjecture was just done in the interest of somebody making a mistake, using that mistake, um, and it was just grabbed onto like wildfire because it kind of justified um, the slave trade, which was absolutely horrible. Uh, it's pathetic that um, African Americans themselves were taught all too often um, by people in the South, by their slave owners, that this was the case. They were cursed by God. It's in the Bible. Therefore, you have to be slaves and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it was illogical. It was um, impossible. And it was just downright shameful. Um, and I always think it's so sad uh, when you read Phyllis Wheatley's poem that she had actually been taught this and, and believed it, uh, that her race had been cursed. Nonetheless, God was forgiving. Certainly, at least uh, per my individual perspective, the latter is true. The first is simply not. And, and that was a horrible um, use of the biblical passage um, in error to justify something people wanted to justify. Um, on to Rip Van Winkle. Sometimes if you read a story um, and you need a little help, a real quick way to do it for analysis is just to put in the title of the story, add the word analysis and see what pops up. Um, to really get the full gist of this story, you've got to read it as an allegory. I think I mentioned that last week in the lecture. Uh, and again, an allegory is a story within a story has a surface story, and then it has a hidden layer underneath. And it's really the layer underneath that is the true story. For example, a surface story might be about two neighbors throwing rocks at each other's homes, but the hidden story would be about war between two countries. 
Some allegories are subtle, some are more obvious. In most allegories, the hidden story has something to do with politics, religion, or morality. Well, certainly this is a story of politics. Um, Rip Van Winkle is a political allegory. So very quickly, what are these allegorical elements in the story? Rip is not really Rip. He is a symbol uh, as to what the British thought about the American colonists, that they were kind of uneducated, um, they were lazy farmers, uh, they weren't really interested in anything intellectual, um, they were just kind of dumb and lazy. They were kind of like lovable little neighbors um, that you didn't have to worry about very much. Dame Van Winkle in this story is symbolic of the British who wanted to control everything and everybody. No one much liked them. Um, and when Rip returns uh, after his 20 year sleep, she is no more. The old village, the village we first see as readers is run down and the passive uh, inhabitants are kind of passive. All they do is gossip. That's their big entertainment. Well, again, when Rip comes back, the new village has changed. It's prosperous, lively. The people are all discussing politics and they are very much involved uh, in the new idea of democracy. The sign above the old tavern in the inn, it, it indicates change. It's totally symbolic of the word change. And if you go through the story uh, and underline every time the word change is used, you'll find it used a lot. So, of course, originally the sign had a picture of King George. Now it has another George uh, on the front of it, uh, George Washington. The debate underway is symbolic of democracy itself. Are you going to vote Federalist? That would be uh, the party of Alexander Hamilton. More in favor of a bigger government, a federal government of all the colonies. Or are you going to vote for a Democrat, in this case Thomas Jefferson? who very much distrusted government, wanted it kept at a, a, a more local uh, level. Um, it's interesting how words have certainly shifted in time and parties have shifted in time. So uh, your Federalists today would be more probably connected with the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party at Jefferson's time would be more likely Republican or maybe even Libertarian because Jefferson simply uh, preferred that government which would govern best is one that governs least, um, a very, very small interfering government. The tale itself, the whole story, um, well, again, change. It was originally an old um, Dutch-German kind of tale, reinvented and set in the Catskill Mountains in an American village with heroes of the revolution being discussed. There's Congress, there's politics. It's a new story, it's an American one. And certainly the theme or narrative argument, the story's argument, America has changed. You better get in step and wake up or you're going to miss a heck of a lot. Okay, on to this week. We have moved ever so quickly from the issue of faith, that fundamental uh, Puritan heritage, how, how Puritan thought kind of certainly played into this whole idea of American Romanticism. Now we're on to the frontier. Words have both denotative and connotative meanings. The denotative meaning of a word you find in the dictionary. Connotative meanings of words maybe are even more important because they're the associations that come to your mind when you hear a word. For the Americans, that extreme limit of settled land beyond which was wilderness was nothing but symbolic of endless ongoing freedom. Freedom from civilization, freedom for opportunity. And the frontier is one of those words, um, literally a line, a dividing line on, on a map. But 
for Americans, it embodied so, so much more. This idea of frontier included all of those aspects uh, of American Romanticism listed uh, on your uh, given page in your course. Romantic ideas of this frontier led to ongoing westward expansion. This phrase refers to the endless pursuit of unsettled land, wilderness, that took the 13 original colonies to the Mississippi River, eventually all the way to the Pacific Coast. Began with the Louisiana Purchase. It was fueled by such things as the Gold Rush, several gold rushes, Oregon Trail, eventually the railroad across the country, and by a firm belief in manifest destiny. So kind of go through some of this. To understand being free from civilization, I, I want to talk just for a minute about probably uh, the most recognizable frontiersman. Um, recognizable because in every image he has on his leather, uh, homespun leather uh, fringed jacket and his coonskin hat, that's a Davy Crockett. Uh, Davy Crockett was born in 1786 in Tennessee. He ran away from school, elementary school, never went back. He was not stupid, however. He just liked being out in the wild. Um, he was well liked. In 1817, he was appointed magistrate in Western Tennessee. He was then elected colonel of the local militia, certainly fighting against um, Native American uh, tribal altercations, etc. at that time. He was later elected to the Tennessee State Legislature and finally to Congress. In Congress, Crocklet, Crockett mainly focused on, and his big fight was that squatters, uh, people who simply came to these open lands, could keep the land they settled um, and freely live on it. The Whig Party, another political party of the day, kind of wanted to suck him in and use him as the face of their party. What a great image, this frontiersman. And they wined and dined him. They gave him gifts. Um, historians have concluded that politics, as well as more and more people moving into Tennessee, uh, what Crockett said, this ever encroaching civilization uh, resulted in his becoming less and less interested in all things political. He told his political backers, you can go to hell, I'm going to go to Texas. And he rounded up a few friends, packed it up, and he did just that. He went to Texas, uh, which at that time was the newest frontier. Um, Texas at that time was extremely wild. Um, the majority of people here were Comanches and Apaches. It was very thinly populated by Mexicans um, and at that time was under the control of the Republic of Mexico. It was a territory. Mexicans couldn't get Mexicans to come to these wild lands, so they opened the territory up to Anglo-American settlers, called them impresarios, um, and paid them if they could get people from America uh, to come and live in the territory and civilize it. Um, long, long story short, eventually enough people were here that they began resenting the control and the ever-increasing taxation without representation, here we go again, um, that they were... Um, being faced with um, with the Mexican government. So we ended up with battles with Santa Ana, Alamo, Goliad, San Jacinto, and finally the Republic of Texas was established. Such freedom fighters, such frontiersmen as Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, William Barrett Travis came to this frontier known as Texas. They died at the Alamo. Why? because they were convinced that freedom from oppression and the opportunities for the individual 
in settlement of the wilderness was a worthwhile dream. They believed, as did the vast majority of Americans, in the idea of manifest destiny. John O'Sullivan introduced this term in an article in 1845 in the Democratic Review. The idea caught on, became very popular. Um, the first essay, O'Sullivan uh, expressed this romantic uh, vision of America's place in the world. It was used as the touchstone uh, in 1845 in an article where he actually first introduced that term, and I'm quoting him. The far-reaching, boundless future will be the era of American greatness. In its magnificent domain of space and time, the nation of many nations is destined to manifest to mankind and the world the excellence of divine principles, to establish on earth the noblest temple ever dedicated to the worship of the Most High, the sacred and the true. Its floor shall be a hemisphere, its roof the firmament of the star-studded heavens, and its congregation the union of many republics comprising hundreds and hundreds of happy millions, calling, owning no man master, but governed by God's natural and moral law of equality, of peace and goodwill amongst men. Boy, if that isn't an American romantic statement, there is not one. Um, he captures all of that lofty idealism, individualism, uh, the idea that the wilderness is here for Americans to uh, conquer, to explore, to uplift, and all of it, of course, um, sanctioned uh, by God's design. Well, people everywhere began to get curious about this endless westward expansion. So travelogues became an important aspect of American literature. A travelogue is simply a recording of an individual's travels. Now, that may sound a bit boring to us today, but again, we've got to keep it in historical context. No movies, no social media, um, no Amazon, I hoped. Um, you had nothing to entertain you except books and adventures. And certainly these travelogues that recorded tales of unknown places in the wilderness, again, this wild west, this frontier, um, were hugely successful. You're going to read two very short excerpts uh, from travelogues this week, one by Frances Parkman, who lived from 1823 to 1893. Um, he is best known as the author of The Oregon Trail, um, and, and he was considered one of America's best historians. Um, certainly his uh, pivotal work is considered a classic of American literature. Your other travelogue, Mark Twain, uh, who lived from 1835 to 1910. Samuel Langhorne Clemens, known by his pen name, Mark Twain. He was an American writer, a humorist entrepreneur, publisher, lecturer. He was allotted as the greatest humorist in the United States. William Faulkner called him the father of American literature. I surely do hope that someday you read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer uh, to your children. It's a children's work. Um, more importantly, that you read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn yourself uh, it is a, a work for an adult audience. It is profound, um, probably the best soliloquy um, that is uh, in literature, a person who's talking to himself. In this case, Huck Finn has this wonderful debate with himself. He's just a kid and he's floating down the Mississippi River. He's run away from an abusive father. He runs into an escaped slave, Jim. And all he's been taught is that runaway slaves need to be turned in. That's the law. And 
as he travels with Jim, he realizes something's wrong. Jim is a good, good man. He kind of ends this debate with himself saying, you know, if not turning Jim is going to send me to hell, then I guess I got to go to hell because I just can't do it. Um, it is an excellent, excellent book and quite a commentary on um, slavery and the evils and, and just the injustice uh, that went along with it. It's, again, it's one of those bucket lists. Do read it sometime. Um, so you're going to be reading, uh, be reading from Twain, um, one of his travelogues. Um, in addition to everything else, he was a traveling man. He went all over the world, wrote books, a very successful book about his travels in Europe and in the Holy Land, uh, went to Israel before it was Israel. I mean, it was nothing. Um, and his statement, um, his description of that area, um, quite interesting. It does a very good job describing how empty it was, nomads, um, just a devoid, uh, deserted, deserted and desert lands. Much has changed there. Um, you're going to read an excerpt from his book, Roughing It. Um, the whole thing is great. Um, but some of his travels out west in the frontier very well described. Mark Twain is an excellent writer. Last but not least, you're going to be reading a short story set at America's Last Frontier. I hope that rings a bell, and that would be Alaska. This story was written by Jack London. London lived from 1876 to 1916. He wrote more than, hold on, 50 books, 200 short stories, 400 nonfiction articles. He has been translated into 57 languages. His literature includes socialist protests, science fiction fantasies, anthropological romances, utopian writings, agronomical tracts, ecological essays, hoboing tales, he was a bum for a while, prize fighting accounts, apocalyptical imaginations, autobiographical portrayals, dog stories, which are really stories of philosophy, and sea sagas. Uh, he also worked on a sailing vessel at one time. He was the first American author to make a million dollars strictly off of his writing. Uh, that's about 1918, hmm, um, no, 19, maybe 1910, he would have accumulated a million dollars. That would be pretty much like 30 million today. So, um, yeah, uh, he was very well read. His major works, Call of the Wild, White Fang, and The Sea Wolf have been adapted to films oh, numerous, numerous times. Jack London once said, life is not a matter of holding the good cards. Sometimes it's just playing a bad hand well. So he certainly believed in the power of the individual. Again, that notion of the American dream you you can be dealt a bad hand and he was he uh was born into immense poverty um he was a bastard that word at that time was damnable um as i mentioned he ended up um, he was a pirate oyster he was a hobo um a bum um and one of the hundred thousand young men who went to the Klondike in Yukon Territory during the Klondike Gold Rush, 1896 to 1899. A lot of those young men died. Um, and the Klondike, Yukon, well, today we would call it Alaska, but it wasn't yet a state. So it was just a territory, um, wild territory, frozen territory. Um, gold was found and young men rushed to make their their fortune in gold. Most did not, of course. London did not make a dime financially, but he gained a lot of material that he used to write great stories, one of which you will read this week, To Build a Fire. Now, I need you to focus on one thing as you're reading this story, because students sometimes go, I don't get how this is romantic. How is this American romanticism? Because it, it shows a man, an individual, and he is alone. 
who strikes out on his own and fails. How does that extol the individual? Well, several times in the story, the narrator, who is London, he's writing, um, the, the narrator's voice says again and again, the man could not think. He was devoid of imagination. So had the man, back to American Romanticism, and the power of the imagination, the ability to dream and see what's coming, had he had an imagination, he could have succeeded. He just flat didn't. Um, so kind of keep that in mind as you're reading the story this week. It's pretty good. Um, highly descriptive. Uh, London has been considered one of the best American writers when it comes to imagery. You will see and hear and taste and smell, touch. Woo. Um, all of five senses are covered and well utilized. Um, description is just exceptional. Okay, so that kind of reviews a little bit of last week and sets you up for this week. Um, do have a happy Thanksgiving and stay safe and don't hesitate uh, to contact me if you have questions. Bye.